Everyone's mics working? I think so. I guess. Am I? <laughs> yep. You're good to go. Um, so I'll just go around and, and briefly introduce everyone. Um, we have uh, Liz Malm, who's an economist for the Tax Foundation. Thank you for, for being here. We have uh, Jonathan Williams, who runs the uh, Tax and Fiscal Task Force at the American Legislative Exchange Council. And Professor Christine Reese, who's here at uh, Econ Economist, uh, Professor of Economics at Georgia Tech, so right here down the street. Um, so with that, what are you just going to start? Um, obviously, the title of our panel is about old tax reforms. Um, I know uh, Tax Foundation and Alec were really engaged in, in all the states this year in terms of getting tax reform. I think the most notable is probably North Carolina. Um, Liz, can you talk about a little bit about what the Tax Foundation did and kind of what were the, how they kind of come up with the tax plan that they actually um, ended up passing? Absolutely. Well, we've been working in North Carolina for quite a while, since last year, in fact. We put out a book in January where uh, my two colleagues, Scott, um, Scott Drecker and Joe Henchman, put together four tax reform plans that uh, legislators and stakeholders in the state could look at and kind of pick and choose as to what kind of things they wanted to do which would improve the business climate and the tax code within North Carolina. And so that came out in January after we went down and Talk to people who were interested, businesses that were interested, um, met with legislators, met with people to find out what people cared about and what they saw as problems with the state tax code. Um, and then when the legislative session started, we were very busy because if you if you follow North Carolina at all, you know there was there was plan after plan after plan that came out. And there was a lot of discussion, and so um, uh, I went down there and I did a debate to talk about uh, the tax code with Jared Bernstein, which was which was really exciting, a very lively debate, but it was. It was good. Um, Scott Drinkard went down and uh, testified before the Finance Committee. And throughout all of this, we've been using our state tax climate index. It's where we uh, evaluate state tax codes on a business tax climate based on a variety of variables. So rates, bases, if the tax code is complicated, what kind of exemptions and deductions are available. Um, and we rank the states according to those things. And so when states are doing uh, legislation and looking at bills, we can run the index for them and see how they're their, their index score would increase uh, if they pass the tax tax reform plan. So that was a big part of uh, what we did there. Every time when we plan to come out, we would help them with an index run, and then ultimately we got a we got a bill out of there. So, so successful. in terms of that tax business plan, which is a great resource if you guys have not used it, I use it a lot, citing it. Um, where did North Carolina move? Well, briefly, why don't you talk about what what were the reforms that they ended up with? So the ultimate reform package that passed it will flatten the uh, the code from a few brackets to one and lower the rate. So the income tax. Yes, and then it lowers the corporate income tax as well. Uh, the, the estate tax was eliminated retroactive to the beginning of this year. Um, there was a slight expansion of the sales tax base to a few services, but not as many as a few plans that were floated earlier. But the most exciting part, I think, is the, the income tax reform that happened. So if that moved uh, North Carolina from where in your, your climate ratings? I believe the final bill, so they were 44th originally, and I think they moved ultimately up to 17th was the final. Wow. So it was, it was a big jump. It was the most prominent jump we've had um, since we've had seen state tax reform. So it's a big, very, very big Sure. Um, Jonathan, obviously you guys have your, your great book, um, Rich States, Poor States. Um, I'm sure many of you guys have it. If not, you can ask Jonathan for it. Uh, you guys did it with Art Laffer. Um, and Stephen Moore and yourself, and you guys have been doing this for, is it the fifth one? Or six years. Six years, yeah. wow. Uh, and and that, they do similar stuff to kind of what the, the business climate rate is, but can you talk about a little bit about that, and maybe uh, where North Carolina ranks and where you can, do you envision North Carolina moving up because of their tax code? Yeah, so uh, anybody from North Carolina here? All right, great, well congratulations. I mean, that was a historic reform this year, uh, moving the ball in the right direction. And our rich states, poor states report uh, takes a, a little bit of a broader look since we don't just look at taxes, we look at regulatory and labor climates as well in the states. Uh, things like right to work and, uh, and other measures that affect competitiveness. And of course, uh, North Carolina ranked pretty well in some of those areas already. And so we got North Carolina starting a little bit better just because of our different metrics that, you know, about uh, middle of the pack. And we estimate that under this reform, North Carolina is going to move to as high as number five in rich wow. states, poor states uh, rankings. And so it's a good story for you all across the country to say that 
you know, while you might have a mediocre uh, tax climate or system right now, there's hope and it can be done. And uh, it was done in a fairly short amount of time in North Carolina as well. And we tend to think about tax reform as a long-term proposition. In many cases, it is. Uh, the federal tax reform in 1986, the, uh, the last time we really did anything with our federal tax code, you know, was started in the late 1970s and they didn't accomplish it until 1986. And so that was longer term. But, you know, thank goodness we actually work on, work on state policy where you can make a difference in a shorter matter of time. And, and congratulations to those in North Carolina that did so this year. Sure. Um, obviously, the, one of the main reasons I want to bring up tax reform is we really do, from, from our vantage point, really is a merging issue. I mean, um, you know, last year we had a couple states kind of put their toe in the water. We had a, a, a great reform idea out of Louisiana that didn't really gain any traction. We had other states looking to decrease their income taxes, like Oklahoma. I know Wisconsin has a, a committee on it. Um, also, Georgia has a, they're looking into, uh, hopefully, in the near future, reforming their tax code. Um, let's, you can talk about what's going on in Georgia and where you'd like to see them go. I would like to see us go to 3%. <laughs> My fair tax friends like to say, well, you know, couldn't we go lower than that? And then people come up and say, can't we go to zero? Uh, and um, I'm happy to brag about what's going on in North Carolina because that just shows that one of the things I usually say that is if you hold still and don't do anything, you're going to fall farther behind. So holding still is really not an option. Um, but we, uh, I was on the tax Special uh, Council for Tax Reform and Fairness number of you uh, know about that group, but we put forth a really um, nearly perfect uh, program of tax reform, I think three years ago. And um, I'm going to be interested to talk more about what happened in North Carolina, but our big problem, one of the big problems, was the numbers. That, um, for one thing, we had the, the budget and the legislators wanting to be sure that there wasn't going to be a big tax revenue shortfall. And so every time that you did something, you had to really assure people um, there wasn't going to be a shortfall. And that meant really talking pretty convincingly about uh, short-term results when you're talking about a reform package that basically is a long-term long -term, pro-growth reform package. And so even though the results happen pretty quickly, it does take a while. And um, so anyway, you would, one of the issues that we had was, was the numbers. Um, that said, we did um, I, uh, something that was really important that the legislature got accomplished the following year, which was to go into our sales tax code and um, look at sales tax exemptions and rationalize and streamline that and clarify that for mining, manufacturing, and agriculture. And Dave Lee, one of the people who helped, <laughs> helped with that in the mining area, and so we can probably testify what, what everybody went through. But, Basically, we put together teams of um, some academics and uh, industry people together in those three industry groups. And we said, give us a really logical, very, very simple tax sales tax exemption scheme. You know, what counts and what doesn't. Clean it up. Get the uh, rubber wheel tractor tires off of the books. Uh, clean it up and make it transparent and simple and logical and economical. Um, and they did that. And they boiled down hundreds of pages of code into a couple pages of code. Um, and I know that uh, Lee Fris has called me, I think, two weeks after this was passed and said he had already identified three companies that came to Georgia because that, that piece got passed. So it's not something that people, you mentioned that in North Carolina there was a little bit of that rationalization done. But there's some pretty clear guidelines. Um, it's not sexy. Um, it's not something that brings the heat up in the, in the media. So you can get it done. And I think it's probably you know, close on as effective as cutting income tax rates. I mean, it really, really makes a big difference in terms of things. So we did that. And um, now we have uh, legislators come to me all the time and say, can't we get uh, tax reform back on the table? And the question is whether our legislators will introduce that as a possible topic in the next session. And uh, I ask people all the time, and some people say absolutely yes, and others say absolutely not. So we have Judson Hill started a um, Fair Tax Study Commission, commi study committee, and we've already had one hearing on that. Um, we have some uh, legislators in the House who are also introducing 
study groups and study commissions. And so we have just people in the grassroots constantly working to try to get um, pro uh, pro growth, which is lower income tax rates, <coughs> pro growth tax reform back on the table. Yeah, I mean, I know at, at Alec last week, uh, Stephen Moore talked from the Wall Street Journal. He was talking about he'd love to see the entire Southeast um, just go, you know, start phasing out their income tax. You already have um, out, uh, Florida, you have Tennessee with that one. There's some great reforms in North Carolina going in that direction. And you could kind of keep that wave going. I think you'd see a lot of this. And, and obviously, pressure from outside states, your neighboring states, that's really going to be what kind of carries the ball. So, it really, I think. You know, they called, I think 2012, the Wall Street Journal called it the year of tax reform. But that was nothing, I would say, compared to what we had in 2013. And I think that's just going to kind of lift off from here. Um, on that note, what do you, what, uh, you know, starting with you, Liz, what do you kind of see as maybe some of the states um, that might move forward with some type of tax reform next, next year? I'm hoping we'll see Nebraska next year because although they didn't do anything this year, the, they started a tax study commission that I believe the, the commission report is due in December. I spoke with the legislator from there yesterday. And I think it's due in December, and they're going to make recommendations as to how to reform that tax code. And so I'm hoping we'll see some movement there. Um, on, the, on the negative side, I'm, I'm thinking we're going to have a little bit of work to do in some other states as well. We were speaking with Jonathan this morning about Nevada. They have a nasty margin tax coming on the ballot, um, similar to how Texas does theirs. And so I think we might need to fight that a little bit. But um, I'm hoping Nebraska will, will see some movement, hopefully Louisiana. Um, since we got that on the national discussion this session, hopefully we can move forward with it. Well, so I think that kind of moving in the opposite direction with Minnesota, which exactly. has pretty much every tax under the sun, and I know we're <laughs> We call it tax or so. There you go, tax or so. Tax or so. Tax or so. We obviously are always trying to uh, you know, fight back on, in terms of really detrimental tax uh, tax increases. Jonathan, do you, I mean, what other states, maybe that you mentioned, or what, what do you kind of see for 2014? Are you optimistic? I am optimistic. I, I think you know we're going to see this continued balkanization in a way between the mm -hmm. states because you're going to have those few states that think taxes don't matter to growth, and then you can get away with raising taxes on everything. The Minnesotas, the Californias, the Illinois, the Maryland, uh, the New Yorks of the world that are going to continue moving in that direction, not learning from the past, hoping that uh, they continue to do the same thing over and over again, that they'll get different results. And uh, you know that's their strategy. Now, on the other hand, I think you have a majority of states, you know, at least 30 to 35 states that are very open to pro-growth tax reform. Uh, and I really hope that what Steve was talking about at our ALEC meeting uh, last week is true that we're going to have a region or two that we can narrow down and say, hey, this competition is so great in this region. And that's the thing that we as free market advocates, people that believe in free markets and free ideas, Tax competition is the best thing we have going for us. You know, there's no such thing as building Berlin Wall across your state border to keep capital within. Uh, my friend Travis Brown, who also uh, spoke at our ALEC meeting, he says that over the last 15 years, $2 trillion in wealth have gone from one state to another, and 43 million Americans have gone from one state to another. And so let's say in the case of Georgia, when you're sandwiched by two new income tax states in Florida and Tennessee, and then all of a sudden you have another neighbor like North Carolina in the region, uh, you know, make significant reforms. You have Louisiana talking about reforms. You have Arkansas talking about major tax reforms. That type of a pressure and that type of competition I think is what's going to lead more states in that direction. It's very uh, encouraging to see so many states open to these pro-growth reforms. Sure. Um, Professor Reese, what, what have you seen in some of the, you know, and obviously you're from Georgia, you've dealt with Georgia, what are some of the political kind of barriers? And, and that would be kind of a question for everyone, because that's really what we're talking about. I mean, obviously each state is different politically, but what are some of the main political barriers or, you know, what, what are the biggest roadblocks that legislators say, well, we can't do this because of this? I mean, you mentioned, you know, basically saying, well, if we cut the taxes, then we're going to have this much less revenue. How, how can we do that? I mean, what are, what are some of those barriers that, that, we, that you can come here in Georgia or talk to other people about? Well, I, you know, I'm just going to, uh, it, it really is a lack of information, a lack of thought, a lack of numbers. <laughs> Um, and so some of the things that we're saying really fly in the face of um, common sense or, or logic, I guess, or conventional wisdom. Um, and we just mentioned one about uh, revenue, that if you cut income tax rates, doesn't that mean that state tax revenue is going to fall? It doesn't make sense, does it? Cut income tax rates, state tax. And that's what most people think immediately. And then um, you can 
go from there to say, well, if state tax revenue falls, that means that all kinds of welfare benefits will also be cut, and the state budget will have to be cut. So you kind of connect this as if you cut income tax rates, that means you're going to lower taxes on rich people and take benefits away from poor people. So it becomes a whole, a whole idea of regressive tax structure um, is something that sort of makes sense to people if they don't examine it. Um, and so uh, one of the things that has intrigued me about the problem is the whole idea of public education. And we have a, a program going that is an intent to educate the public about these ideas and get people to do a little bit of thinking, a little bit of analysis on their own. Um, and I can talk about that later. It's called, uh, if you go to ta www tax reform the game. We have a little calculator in there that um, many of you have used. Some of you have told me that it might be listed in your divorce proceedings because you stay up all night playing with the game. Um, but, uh, but people, again, people are using that really actively. And what that does is it allows people to see that you make trade-offs. You make trade-offs. Sure. I, I think that's what's really important about the studies that Tax Foundation and, and Jonathan Williams has done um, with ALEC. I mean, we, we live in a dynamic economy. Um, obviously, I know the federal government uses a lot of static uh, economic models. We really do, I mean, we, we, we live in a dynamic economy, and, you know, just because you cut taxes a certain amount doesn't mean you're going to lose static amount of revenue. I mean, you're, you may build up more sales tax revenues or more corporate tax revenues. Um, and, and because of growth, you will actually come up with more revenues rather than fewer, which is the kind of counterfactual that, again, we have all kinds of proof about this, but countries over time, um, states over time, states and countries that take the tax up and then take it down and so on. Um, but when you start to try to explain that to people, they go, oh, economics, numbers, and they sort of glaze over. And it's, again, it's the sort of whole laugh curve thing that is just hard to get people to really believe it and hard to get people to see it. And so I think that's one challenge. I want to say one phrase that um, I used really early on when I began working on this, and, and it just seems to hit every time I use it, and that is to say, if you want more of something, don't tax it. If you want more growth, and you want more jobs, and you want more income, and you want more innovation, don't tax it. And that sort of is a, one of those things that flies, it goes in the other direction. And, you know, when you say that, people kind of look at you, or reporters, and say, gee, that makes sense, huh, you think? <laughs> because I think we need to, those of us who realize that we're talking about growing our economies and making our economies more healthy, we've got to be much more proactive about stating that and kind of get off the defensive. But again, it's an education process. Sure. Um, well, I mean, we've got, so, you know, but as uh, Justice Brandeis would say, you know, we have these 50 laboratories of democracy, and this concept, I think, works very well, examining what works and what doesn't, and that's really the whole concept around our rich states, poor states project. You know, we have nine of these laboratories without personal income taxes. These are states that don't tax work, that don't tax investment, that don't tax productivity. Uh, and look at the results in those nine states. You know, look at Texas. I mean, you gained four congressional seats in the last 10 years. That's how many people are you know, moving to Texas. Anybody from Texas here? Uh, it's, it's just incredible the growth in Florida and Texas. Uh, even states that are very regionally diverse states, it's not just southern states in this case. Of course, New Hampshire, uh, the live for your die state, no state income tax and no state sales tax. Uh, they do it by keeping government limited, but you, you track the progress of these nine states with no income taxes, two and a half times greater job growth over the last 10 years, greater population growth, greater income growth, uh, and by the way, more money than Texas is getting all these new taxpayers. That's really the key, is not raise tax revenue by raising tax rates, but by increasing the amount of taxpayers paying into the system. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Um, on the flip side of that, kind of moving into another issue, obviously, we'll, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A on the packet form, because I know there's a lot of questions about that, how their state can do it. Um, you know, in, in Illinois, which is where Heartland is, um, our biggest problem is they just raised income and corporate taxes a huge amount. They were temporary. Now they're looking into making them permanent. Uh, right now we have a flat income tax, and it's likely there's going to be some sort of movement towards a progressive income tax. And the biggest driver of that is really pensions, public pensions. And I know Alec uh, did a great uh, public pensions report. I'm sure you can get it from Jonathan Williams. Um, if you look at all the states that are either raising their taxes or are struggling to even start talking about tax cuts, it, it really is a big drive of these public pension systems. Um, what have you seen on, on that? Are we optimistic on public pensions or 
are we? Um, yeah, I mean, folks, I mean, I think this is the existential crisis of our time when it comes to government finances is the unfunded liabilities and public pension systems and the OPEP, other post-employment health care benefits for state workers. Uh, you know, it's not just Detroit uh, that we've talked about recently. Of course, that's raised the awareness of this issue to get in the news. We forget that just in the last year, San Bernardino, California, a city of 300,000, Stockton, California, a city of roughly 300,000, both also declared bankruptcy, as well as other towns in California. And, you know, this is a major pension uh, liability or a major driver of this. And it's not a question of, you know, if the liabilities are going to affect your state or your localities. It's a question of when they affect it. And, of course, Illinois has become the basket case for this. Uh, the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, actually uh, filed suit against the state of Illinois a couple of months ago for uh, securities fraud. Uh, this is only the second time in the history of our country that the SEC has taken this type of action. Um, and so, uh, you know, Governor Mitch Daniels of Indiana once called being next to Illinois is kind of living next to the Simpsons. They really don't have their act together. You know? uh, and uh, I think the, the way to describe this situation is a Senator Lillingfish from Utah who wrote this report for us we just released last week. Uh, he describes the pension unfunded liabilities as a chemical spill. The first thing you have to do is contain, and then you have to make reforms. And so we take a look at several case studies, and this is why I'm optimistic about pension reform. It's A, because it's been done by both Republican and Democrat states across the country. Rhode Island uh, has saved $3 billion off their unfunded liabilities in the last couple of years. This is a state where I could probably count the number of Republican legislators on both my hands. Uh, they realized it was a financial reality issue instead of a partisan issue. We had Utah, a very conservative state. We had Michigan, my home state, that actually got way ahead of the curve in the late 90s, transferred all state employees into a new defined contribution 401k system like every, all of us have in the private sector. So that's why I'm optimistic is people are realizing that it's not so much a partisan issue anymore. I mean, Rahm Emanuel is taking this up in Chicago. He said property taxes would have to be increased by 150% in the city of Chicago if there wasn't reform on pensions. Uh, Willie Brown, former uh, liberal speaker of the California Assembly, has taken this up as an issue as well. Folks, this is a huge issue, and it's not a partisan one. It's a financial one, and we have to get ahead of it, because as any good financial planner will tell you, if you put off a financial problem, the reality doesn't get better on its own. This is something that's going to take reform. Yeah, in Illinois, I mean, we're less than 50% funded. It's, it's a huge problem because, uh, I mean, we're billions of dollars behind in paying bills. So, uh, you know, this is to nonprofit groups, groups of, you know, different vendors. So when you talk about undermining, um, you know, necessary vital core services of government, this pension system uh, in a lot of these states are really uh, starting to push that, you know, that spending out. So I think that's a, a big problem that, like you said, Gina Romando from, from Rhode Island took up and really did some great reforms, and I'm hoping to see some in, in other states as well. Well, I think we will, and uh, just a quick example on that that Senator Lindquist says of Utah is, Utah was America's best funded pension system, over 100% funded before the crash of 2008 that, by the way, go back in your books, you probably lost 25 or 30%, not only your own 401k, but in the state's retirement accounts. So Utah went to a position where they would have to devote 10% of their state general fund for the next 25 years just to pay off the losses of 2008, which meant something like 8,000 teachers would have to come out of the classrooms if they didn't make some sort of reform. So it is going to affect uh, poor services, or it will affect uh, taxes going up. Um, Liz, anything to add? What, what, what is, ta is tax foundation? We don't really work on pensions, but I, I do think that I'm glad you brought up um, the fact that, well, this is going to make us have to cut services. And I found, going back to your, your mention of politically, what are the obstacles, I found that that's actually a way that I can connect with the left on this kind of thing by saying, well, if we don't reform the things that we're doing, whether it's the tax code or the pension system, then we're going to have to cut these things that are important to people. And I found that in North Carolina, that was a way to, to talk about it and be able to engage with people without getting animosity by saying, you know, we don't have to say anything about how big our government's going to be, but we need to, we need to fund it in the most efficient way possible, and we need to make sure that things like this are not going to spiral out of control in the future, because that means that if we have to cut something now, you're going to have to cut even more in the future as this gets exponentially worse. So I think that it's something that we can use to our advantage in terms of engaging the public. Well, I think you can extend that one more piece, and it's uh, the news is taking us to the point where we can actually make this clear to people, and that is, um, as states go bankrupt and cities go bankrupt, we're going to have to pay that. So, um, for instance, when I talk to teachers in Georgia, I say, you know, you, we really have to watch the whole union movement overall because 
Georgia is a very frugal state, but Georgia teachers are going to have money taken out of their pension funds to pay for the pension funds that are juicier in California and Illinois. So the, the laboratories of democracy can cut many ways. And, and just to throw in uh, an issue that I know that I, I addressed for one of Heartland's blogs was um, just how is the federal government going to bail out Detroit? And I hope we've got somebody watching that. But you know, you know it's going to happen. And that's the way these things are going to get some of it. It's going to come out of our pockets. Yeah, people are saying Chicago could be next, which would be huge. Um, obviously, the, I, I know uh, Senator Kirk, I believe, from, from Illinois, just promoted something of you know, not bailing out the cities or the states at the federal level. Um, one other issue before we kind of get into some Q&A, um, this, this idea, I know I was at NCSL earlier this week, as many of you guys were, and they're talking about the Marketplace Fairness Act, taxing the internet. Um, I've, I've seen some of the states uh, talk about, well, you know, I'd be open to reducing the income tax. I know Scott Walker said that, if, if we pass this. Uh, what, what is kind of your guys' take, uh, Alec? I know you guys have some principles on internet taxation. What, what is your kind of ideas of what's going on, on in that sphere? Yeah, no, so usually the first way to get yourself shot at an event like this is talk about internet taxes. <laughs> we have people on both sides of this issue. We have for years. Now, Alec has taken a position going back to the late 1990s saying that we're pretty skeptical of this idea of taxing uh, internet purchases for uh, remote sellers, as this case would do. And so it would be, in a way, a new tax on small businesses in terms of collecting that new tax. And that's really the aspect that we're most concerned about is, you know, there's something like 9,600 taxing jurisdictions between states and localities, and, and Liz and, and Chris, I know you guys follow these sales tax bases all the time, where they're always changing the definitions. They're always having these sales tax holidays, uh, and they're, you know, how in the world is a small mom and pop retailer that wants to put up a website and start selling outside of their state, let's say in Utah or something, to know all of all these changes in 9600 <coughs> jurisdictions. So we think that the Supreme Court got it right in the Quill decision that said this is an undue burden on interstate commerce. Now, as uh, right of center legislators, we're all pretty concerned about where Congress is taking the interstate commerce clause, and, and the courts have interpreted that as being a carte blanche to increase government. However, I think this is one of the founders' original intent of the interstate commerce clause to protect uh, commerce from these type of uh, niche type tax burdens that could complicate uh, growing businesses going forward. And I think small businesses will and will continue to be the growth engine of our economy, the ones that are creating the new net jobs. And uh, as someone uh, as like the head of Overstock.com just recently said, Overstock.com would not exist if this type of tax regime were in place when they got started. So that type of thing really causes our members concern. I think it, I'm glad you brought up the 96, I, I don't know the exact number, I know at least over 9,000 9, different taxing jurisdictions within the U.S. Local, state and locally, but so I think that I mean, regardless of whether or not you agree with the Marketplace Fairness Act or not, it's got to be tied to some sort of simplification thing because that that's just not it's not possible for small retailers like that. And I think, but I, but I also think we need to remember that this issue is not going to go away because states have a shrinking sales tax revenue. Um, there's a lot of things that are contributing to that. Uh, states exempt a lot of essential ser essential goods and services for um, as a means to increase progressivity. So things like food, things like clothing under hundred dollars, things like uh, things that they dub essential services, that carves away the sales tax base. Uh, most states don't tax services, so that's two-thirds of most economies that are not taxed, um, and everybody shops online, so uh, this isn't gonna go anywhere. So I think it's definitely something we need to look at and figure out how to deal with, because if like we want to go pro-growth and reduce reliance on income taxes, we've got sales taxes left, so we have to definitely have to address it. Yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting, and even the Amazon, who's kind of the biggest opponent of this in the beginning, they realize that for them to be successful and compete with the Walmarts, Targets, those types of places, they're going to have to have a brick and mortar store so that they can send it instantly, their products instantly. So, you know, that's why they kind of, you know, admittedly, they kind of deal. They said, well, this isn't really where um, our base is going, and we're going to have to have a physical presence. So it's interesting to see where, where, that's, where that, that debate's going. Um, but I, I know I've, uh, we get a lot of questions about it. It's, it's a federal and state issue. Um, have you done any work on it? Internet tax, so what's your kind of over you all? Well, two things. One is, um, one could argue that the reason Amazon is for this is because it dramatically increases their own reach. They are going to be able, they're going to be the ones that are going to be able to keep track of the 9,000 jurisdictions, and they're going to turn into a big tax collection agency. I know sometimes when we talk about actually collecting sales taxes in Georgia, I sometimes sort of jokingly say, well, American Express do it, they'll get the money collected. <laughs> well, in this case, Amazon's going to do it. So they're going to be, they're going to have a computer.
computer power and the ability, and so more and more small businesses are going to be forced through Amazon to do that. But I have to admit, just on a um, sort of um, conceptual level, um, I think the bottom line for taxes is you ought to tax as close to the services as you can. So you should move towards fees so that the tax should be to provide services. So if somebody in Seattle is doing is, is having a business and they're not really generating any costs in Georgia, we shouldn't be taxing them. So that's really the, the whole nexus idea. So just as an economist, philosophically, you really shouldn't do that. However, I want to get taxes in Georgia down to 3%. <laughs> and so would I do something that wasn't really quite exactly along the line of straight economic principles to get there. You know, and this would be one of the ones that would put, but it does push it along because when you when you talk in any kind of group, um, anybody who's in a smaller business is really in favor of this tax. And it's a very it's very not politically. So maybe use it to get the yeah, on, on the opposite side obviously I know we've seen a lot of uh, pushback in terms of you know getting rid of some of these tax exemptions and, mm -hmm. and different uh, favors in the tax code for different businesses. That's obviously a big roadblock to say, well, we don't, well, if we're going to lower, you know, the rates for everyone, then you know, our theory comes from a purely free market stance, well, that's a good thing, and it's worth kind of doing that. But that's obviously kind of the, the flip side of it, is saying, well, if we can expand it to services, which is also expand the sales taxes to services, that's obviously going to get the, the lawyers and uh, all like those, you don't want lawyers to manage it. So, um, <laughs> So that's kind of what, what's going on. Did anyone have any other final questions before we, or comments before we make some questions? Does anyone have any questions? Um, I think Taylor's got the uh, way in the back. Okay, Move your way back. <coughs> um, I'm Barry Fleming. I'm a member of the House here in Georgia. You talked about the problem with implementing the uh, sales tax issue on, on the internet, that your mom and pop store in Utah, you know, won't be able to know what the taxing jurisdiction is in a little town here in Georgia somewhere. Um, you know, in Georgia, we have a speed limit of 55 on those highways. Nobody drives 65. If I know that you drive 64, only nine miles or so over, you won't be stopped. So if you're big enough in Utah to sell a lot, you have the resources to keep up with it. If you're small enough to sell so few, who in Georgia is in, in the town that everyone come look for you? So I mean, is that really a problem uh, with this idea of, of, of taxing? Well, I think you know it adds a lot of uncertainty to small businesses. You're probably right. If you're a big guy, you're going to probably be able to comply with it. And I think that's the whole point. Is as these guys are getting bigger, then they have to develop physical presence. And I think at the end of the day, that may prove why physical presence standard actually works. Is once you get to a certain level, you actually have to expand. Uh, and create more physical presence, and that gets back to user fee in a way of government services as well. Uh, but for the small mom and pop, who let's just say is uh, you know, putting up a website and wants to start selling, uh, maybe they meet the minimum threshold in the bill, or maybe not, and a million dollars is a lot of sales. Uh, and maybe they do that. You know, it's more about the issue of you know, maybe they will, maybe they won't track us down, but that potential liability there, the potential for auditing from different uh, entities across the country. The last thing, if I were a conservative Utah business, is to be dragged before a New York uh, tax court. That would be that would give me uh, terror in the middle of the night and cold sweats thinking about that. And so maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't, but it's the uncertainty I think that would keep people from doing business. I think the other uh, kind of misconception, I, I even saw, I believe it was a New York Times who did a story on it. Uh, maybe you can actually talk actually, about that. Actually, Joe is the one that is. Joe, Joe is the one that's like, he's all about work. He knows it. If you have a question about it, he's the guy to go to. But yeah, it's, there's a lot of uh, confusion as to what is going on. I don't think people really understand it. Um, and so that makes it hard to talk about. Yeah, basically, the New York Times was saying, well, we need to level the playing field so that everyone, you know, mm -hmm. both brick and mortar and online and, and other retailers are taxed the same. Uh, the, the misconception is, though, when I go to, say, a, a Walmart here in Georgia, I'm paying the tax where that Walmart is located. Um, online, they want to change it to where I'm paying to wherever that business is located in another state. Um, but it's actually where you're, you're located. So it's where the consumer is located rather than where the business is located. So they're actually trying to create a different one. I think a lot of the groups up here would be in favor of saying, well, I'll, ta I'll pay the tax based on where the business is located according to the nexus. 
That would be easy because, I mean, obviously when you go and buy a pack of gum at Walmart, they don't ask you in what jurisdiction you're going to chew the gum at. That would be that would be the destination version of the tax. But we allow those businesses to just pay the tax where they're located, and that may be a fair rule to for internet. Yeah, the origin-based. Right, the origin-based idea. Art Whitting from uh, Montana. Uh, by design, our income tax system is progressive. And uh, I had three bills to reduce income taxes, two vetoed, one not making it, its way out of the committee. Uh, but one of the hearings, the governor's office opposed it and brought up a chart, bar graph, 10 deciles showing how the rich would benefit from this um, tax bill. Uh, 10%, top 10% paid 50% of the tax, top 25% paid. 90% of the tax, and therefore any reduction is similar. And I use the graph to say, but that's who is paying the tax. The people that are receiving the benefit are the ones paying the tax. But but we've created barriers to tax reform because we've, through exemptions and credits, we've essentially eliminated 75% of the people from paying income tax. So I'm all on board, okay, on reducing taxes, but is there something that we have to do to address not only this issue of, well, if you reduce the, the rates, you'll reduce revenue, which is what the professor brought up, but also this this uh, issue of, um, you know, benefiting the rich. How do we, how do we address that issue, that equity issue? Well, um, I know Liz will probably want to take a shot at this, too, because they've been fighting this very battle. But, Senator, thank you for your leadership uh, out of Montana. And, by the way, Montana is one of the five states without state sales taxes, which you actually get killed under the uh, internet sales tax idea. And I think your attorney general is taking action on that. But to the income tax uh, question, um, you know, I think the – if we get back to the principle of what do we tax for, I mean, what is the reason we have taxes? It's to pay for core government services. It's not to start micromanaging the economy, picking winners and losers, or redistributing wealth, especially at the state level. Even if you're a progressive and you believe in redistribution, the most effective way of doing that is not through the tax code. It's on the spending side for one thing, and it's not at the state level, it's at the federal level. Uh, we do, studies have shown that re, uh, redistribution does not work through state income taxes very effectively whatsoever. So the most progressive tax systems actually do not have, those states do not have that good of a score when it comes to redistribution. By the way, the best score in all of New England, uh, the state, uh, their Gini coefficient, which is a basic measure of um, redistribution, is, um, is New Hampshire without an income tax. That is the best score of New England. Well, you have all these states like New York and Connecticut tripping all over themselves to raise taxes on high income earners. That type of policy just doesn't work, nor should it when it comes down to the basic principle of what good tax policy should look like. So those would be my two arguments, but I know the Tax Foundation has also uh, worked on this. That was, that was a, big, a big part of my job working in North Carolina was, I think the opposition to this is very, very, they're, they're good at their message and getting it out quickly and being very concentrated. And I found that there's three things I could point out to people that kind of helped me explain why that might not be a great argument. Well, obviously, if a small percentage on the top pays the majority of income taxes and you cut them across the board, they're going to get a larger tax cut. I mean, that's simple math. But the, the way that I sold it was, well, we don't pay taxes in a vacuum at the state level. We also pay in, in the context of the federal system, which is very, very progressive. And if you show the state tax burden um, in the context of the federal tax burden based on income group, it looks still pretty progressive. Um, so I always point that out. And I always would make sure to point out just how much of a state income tax burden was paid by that top group that we were always um, demonizing. And so I made sure that I made that very prevalent when I was discussing. And it's also good to show it in the context of the spending side is too. So when the public finance system has two sides, taxes and spending, and if you show um, government benefits received by income groups, you get a very different picture. And so I made sure that I pointed that out as well. And you can, we can show that too. Um, we just have to make sure that we provide the numbers so that people, people can see it and educate them on, on that level as well. I think there are a couple of things. First of all, those kinds of studies that come out that say such and such people in what income brackets are going to pay certain amounts. Those are um, primarily generated out of some numbers that are run from a left-wing think tank in Washington, D.C. that they push out to left-wing think tanks in the states. And the numbers are wrong, and they sh should be challenged, and we have a group here in Georgia that is challenging them. 
we had a little kerfluffle last week, and I think we really um, we, we really put some of the numbers out there. Those numbers are just not correct. Um, so uh, I want to just say a word about the Tax Foundation, Alex, and other groups like this. Um, and I think we really need to stand behind any of our groups that are being attacked mm -hmm. by the uh, left wing and the progressives in, because they're doing a great job. So um, particularly, we know Alex is in, the, is in the news right now. And uh, I'll write you a check later here. It won't be large, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I seriously, I think we need to really go after these numbers because they're getting put out there as if they're science and as if they're correct, and they're not. And the kerfuffle we had here in Georgia was a group uh, a reporter called me on Monday morning and said, well, what did I think about this study that just came out? And I said, well, I haven't seen it. And he said, oh, well, that's because it's embargoed till tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. So I commented on, in general about the group that produced the study and so on, and I said, you know, fundamentally, they're going to argue for higher taxes and bigger government. So it turns out that this is the group, one of the groups who gets these numbers from a group in Washington, D.C. They will never provide the numbers. They will never tell you where they came from. Believe me, I've tried. Um, they have nobody checking the numbers. And then they embargo them, give them to certain selected news media people. They don't give them to conservative journalists, only to liberal journalists. And then that stuff is out there on Tuesday morning in the paper. And basically, nobody's looked at it. Nobody's checked it. And it's, it, it's incorrect. It's just not true. So I think we need to find ways to really get at that, that source of information is one thing. And I think the other thing on the political side of it, um, you can say that uh, we can cut income tax rates and provide jobs, or we can keep income tax rates the same and not have jobs. Now, in, when we ran some numbers on a dynamic model in Virginia, the jobs that were created were $30,000 a year jobs. And we now have a model that we've just gotten here in Georgia, and we're going to be running those numbers for Georgia. But you're literally talking about if you cut income tax rates, you're going to ge generate not $250,000 a year jobs, you're going to generate $30,000 a year job. So if you're talking to that lower income bracket, you're basically saying, you know, well, first of all, run the numbers and say you're basically saying the tax you pay is, is going to go up by maybe $100 a year. Look at, look at the raw numbers, you know, $100 a year. Um, and you will have a better chance of a $30,000 a year job. Or you can keep your taxes where they are and not have a $30,000 a year job. So that really, at the, at the grassroots level, at the, you know, that's what you're talking about when you talk about pro growth. You're talking about people who don't have jobs, who are not able to tap into the economy, passing a tax reform that won't increase their taxes all that much, but will dramatically increase their chance to get a job. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is to get the numbers out there. So, you know, if you have any questions, obviously reaching out to the Tax Foundation, Alec, uh, Heartland, and other groups like that, I'm sure we're more than happy to try to pull those numbers together. Because it really is a numbers game. I mean, uh, one side's going to say this is what's going to happen, and, and we're going to have a kind of different arguments, but it's, you know, you need the information out there. And I think, um, you know, some of our groups, you know, we, we just don't do a good job of, of communicating, obviously, and we've always struggled with that. So it's, it's obviously getting that information out there uh, to the public, Chris uh, said. Let me just add one more plug here, and that is when I was on the Tax Reform Council, like, we really worked pretty much 28 hours a day for six months. And there were so many times in the middle of the night when I knew that I was going to have to testify the next morning or go into a meeting, and any of these groups, and, you know, I can call, I can get numbers, people would, you know, answer me back in half an hour. So there's all kinds of behind-the-scenes support that these really solid, scientific-based think tanks provide us. Georgia Public Policy Foundation is another one. That, you know, if for those of us who are, are at, at some point in a position of actually being able to affect a change, you know, they've got, you, got your back. And I think we really all have to support yeah, most of the states, I'm sure, have a state-based think tank, and if you don't, I mean, obviously the national groups like Heartland and Alec and Tax Foundation, we, we try to work with our friends on the state level as, as much as possible. Yeah, Joel Foster, Americans for Prosperity Georgia. Um, is in the room with Dr. Reese during the testimony of Senator Judson Hill's uh, Committee on Tax Reform a couple weeks ago, and one of the things you said there, and you say it again today, is a big part of this is messaging. I'm a media guy, old media guy, so I get, I, I love this stuff. But 
uh, you said you made the statement, you know, if you want more of something, don't tax it. And I think there are a lot of legislators in the room, and I think everyone would be interested in knowing, how do you build coalitions of support by bringing the right messaging to the general public? Because I think uh, all of us understand that in a policy arena and in a numbers love, but we love numbers. We embrace numbers, we embrace data. But if I'm out on the street, it, I think a lot of folks don't understand the numbers, tax policy in general, but they do understand trade-offs. And so what are the kind of real-world scenarios you would paint for the general public to say, you know what, I get that. I want more of something, don't tax it, trade-offs. How do we put this in their wheelhouse so that we have coalitions of support from the outside backing us up in addition to the think tanks that are supporting us with the numbers? Yeah. Yeah, I have to plan yeah, because the uh, Americans for Prosperity Georgia also helped support our tax calculator and are supporting the dynamic extension of it too. So, um, yeah, I didn't mention the grassroots, but um, I think that's really critically important. Putting something out like a calculator that can get out of people's hands, and um, you know, I speak and you speak about these things all the time. Just, um, it, it's amazing how many people you run into who, who haven't followed the issue who, given a few pieces of information, can go out and tell their friends and tell their friends and tell their friends. So I think that the, uh, the grassroots organizations are an incredibly important part of it. And then it's up to people like us to work with them to figure out what is the right message. What's the one that's really getting home? I think one of the, one of the things you actually mentioned, which I think is a, good, is a good argument, if you go to someone who's either struggling to find a job or has a lower paying job, and you say, we have to cut the taxes across the board um, or, you know, we're trying to create a better tax system, and you may have to pay $50 more a year or $100 more a year, but we're going to create this many more jobs. I think a lot of people, if they're struggling to find a job, say, okay, you know, maybe once I get that job, I can be able to afford more of that. Um, so I think having the, the pros and cons, um, other than, you know, for regular tax cuts, saying, you know, it's going to save you, even if you make $30,000 a year, it'll save you $200 a year. That's that's five bags of groceries or, or whatever it is. Try to really bring it back to the people and try to explain it in real world uh, areas. Let me just say sort of for the more middle or higher income people, I mean, a lot of people um, are concerned about tax reform if they're in the 90 to 110,000 a year bracket because they know they will be paying more tax, uh, more income taxes. Uh, they may be paying more sales taxes or whatever. But um, if you get a tax reform that's simple, you, if a family like that may pay a thousand dollars more overall, but that's, uh, you can cut your tax preparation costs by that much if you simplify the code. So that, that all these pieces have to fit together in all the packages that we recommend. And they do really work for everybody across the income distribution scale. We just need to be sure that we've got the good message and that we're selling it. On messaging, obviously, well, that's a big important part. I think if the state based groups need to feel welcome to reach out to us so we can help in any way that we can, because, like you said, the, the, the opposition to what we do is very, they're, they're good at what they do, they're good at marketing, and they're good at messaging. And I think that we can stand to learn a little bit from them at, on, on that front, because they're good at disseminating a message and disseminating it quickly, and it's in pithy short statements that people can understand. And I think that's part of selling it too, is uh, um, little statements that you can grab onto and you can say, well, this is going to create this many jobs, or this is going to do this. Um, I think we need, to, we need to get better at that. Um, I, like you mentioned, the calculator, we did that for North Carolina. We worked with um, AFP in North Carolina to uh, put together a calculator for people, and they could go on and type in uh, their, uh, some family characteristics, um, and we would kind of estimate what their new sales tax bill and new income tax bill would be in. So it was a way to kind of sh personalize it and sell it to people, and I think it was really effective. I mean, there's great stories on our side to make the case why lower taxes and more simple tax system is better for growth. All across the 50 laboratories of democracy, we just don't tell it enough. You know, you know, I think if you went to an average person and said, would you rather Georgia be more like Texas or more like California, I think people kind of get it now in the news. But I think we need to make those types of cases more often that you know, this model of big government high taxes does nothing for anybody at any income class. Yeah. Oh, can I just put on the, on the whole Georgia thing? You know, when, when I started on the Tax Reform Council, I knew it was going to be hard and all that, but I kept saying to myself, number one, it's the right thing to do. And people are therefore going to recognize it's the right thing to do. And number two, if you can't get pro-growth tax reform in a red state like Georgia, you can't get it anywhere. Mm. Now where am I? So I think 
you know, we, we really need to do more, we need to do better. Educating the public, um, trying to come up with good stories. Sure. I'm Greg Clifton, Mayor of the City of Fayetteville, home to Pine Mountain Studios, which is a $200 million film, complete film studio that's in progress being built to protect the operation January 1st. A very prime example of if you want more of, tax less of, uh, that does a 30% tax credit, which uh, initiated about five years ago by Mitch Seabog, brought the film industry from uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to billions of dollars over the last five years. And <clears throat> if we reduce our income tax, wouldn't our film credit go away? And the film industry is already the fourth largest in the state at this time. What kind of impact would that have? And it puts me in a conflicted situation with the economic you know, benefit my town is receiving from this. If that doesn't rise up, that would be a, a serious problem. And it seems, I realize that the, the taxation can't be a zero sum game, but if everybody had equal um, tax structure, which obviously never would happen, but if every state had the same structure, then what's the incentive for growth? It seems to me there's got to be a differential. Some states have a better like Texas versus California. So if everybody went the same, then, then where would be the incentive? You know, it's the difference in tax structure that seems to be the incentive for people to come to one place versus another. I think that when we talk about tax competition, we have to be careful because there's good tax competition and there's poor tax competition. And I think that a lot of times states make the mistake of thinking that, well, if I pass these targeted exemptions for this group or this group or this industry or this activity, that, um, that that's tax reform. And, um, I, I'm, yeah, you're right, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to fight against those things when in the communities it does bring people in, but at the same time, overall, you don't want to keep handing out handouts to special interests because then more come in and say, well, I would like special treatment too, and then you don't have a tax base anymore, and then you're back at square one where we don't have any revenue to work with. So I think tax competition is good um, when, it's talk, when we're discussing things like lowering the rate or simplifying, but I'm, I'm hesitant to say that Things like film tax credits or R&D credits or jobs credits are the way to go because um, there's a lot of research that says those might be temporary, those might not um, sustain economy, state, state local economies for long periods of time. So I think we need to make sure we educate people about what kind of tax competition we want to promote. Um, do you have anything to add on that one? Well, uh, you know, I'll tell you, on a 10,000 foot view on this, uh, when you look at some states like Illinois, you know, when they raised taxes by 70% recently on income, on corporate and individual, what was one of the first things they did? They realized that that was going to affect the business community. So you had certain companies that were ready to walk and say, hey, this is the last straw that we're gonna to go to Texas. You have Rick Perry coming up saying, come on down, no income tax, which is a great selling point. But what is the first thing Illinois did to make up for it? They actually gave special carve-outs to CME and to Sears and Roebuck to stay in, in. And so that is, in one sense, a symptom of the larger problem of not being competitive when you have to give out some of these specialized uh, carve-outs. Now, the film industry uh, has certainly uh, gotten a lot of these. My home state of Michigan was one of the most generous programs. That's gotten phased down now, I guess, over time. One of the things I always like to tell legislators to kind of be cautious of when it comes to attracting companies for this type of incentive is, when the grass is greener on the other side, okay. they're probably not going to stay in your state very long. So that's one thing to always be, you know. On the sales part, I mean, being in Illinois, yeah, we, we raised uh, corporate tax rates and then they cut a deal with Sears. They said, well, we'll keep our, our headquarters there. But then almost a week later, they said, well, we're going to still move 2,000 jobs into another state. So you, you really can't trust that. I think it, it's more important to lower across the board corporate tax rate because that's going to bring in not only maybe don't tax industry, but it's going to bring in other industries. And that's what you need to, to try to bring in. You should, I mean, obviously, it, you know, it maybe phase it out over time um, and see if we'll stay, but that will attract other businesses. And I think that's really what we need to do. We, we, can, we have to get out of this mindset of picking winners and losers with the tax code. That's not what it's there for. It's to pay for government services. And it needs to be neutral, it needs to be low, and it needs to be flat. Well, I think, I think one thing you really have to come back to and remember is that this really isn't about competing with other states. That's not where the growth is coming from. Sure, we, if we do, if we have a stronger and better economy than another state, sure, we're going to get people. The growth is going to come from the economy. And what we're talking about is when a government finds uh, Amazon sales tax and a special exemption here and a special tax there, all of those come with complications and layers and fees and so on, and you get distortions in the economy that we can't see those 
But that means that there are jobs and growths that would be there that aren't there, right? We call, it, we, uh, we call it a deadweight loss, but what you're talking about is getting the government's intervention in the economy over a broad race, broad base, and narrow, small rates. And the reason is that you get very many, many fewer distortions. You're taking the lid off the private sector economy, off a of private enterprise, and you're letting it grow. And do not underestimate the power that that has. That is where the growth is coming from. It's not stealing it from another state. It's coming from making a healthier economy. I think we have time for uh, probably one more question. I'm sure they'll be around. Um, I would say uh, after this panel, we're going to go. We're going to take five minutes. We're going to switch the panels, um, and we're going to go right into. Then we're going to have a nice long break after that panel before lunch. So um, you guys will have time to you know, check your emails or, or get copy. And I'm sure they'll be. Uh, if you guys just want to go over there, uh, we can. If you want to have questions for them, uh, but our last question. Thank you. Thanks to the panel. You're, uh, you're great. You're very informative. Um, I'm Bill Taylor, South Carolina State Attorney. Um, Dr. Reese, I, I, early on you sort of alluded to uh, those fair tax people. I'm the primary sponsor of the South Carolina Fair Tax Act uh, for two sessions now. And while I appreciate North Carolina and other states reducing their tax rate, they are still taxing productivity. The fair tax is very simple, it just taxes consumption. And those who make a lot of money are gonna pay a lot more taxes because they're gonna buy big cars and yachts and other things and second homes and all of that. So, you know, the first state that goes to a fair tax will break the watershed and I guarantee that many will follow. Well, that's why I get 3%. Um, yes, 0% income tax is the cleanest, healthiest economy you can get. Uh, it's not at all clear to me and many people that we can get there politically. Um, I believe that if, we, if Georgia can go from 6% to 3%, we can get 80 or 90% of the economic benefits. Um, whereas if we hold out and sort of won't go anywhere until we get to 0%, we won't get anywhere. So the 3% is a compromise, but I think it's a good one that is politically workable, um, that can happen in a really reasonable period of time, um, and then will get 90, 80, 90% of the economic benefits that the fair tax would. Yeah, we have nine states more or less with the fair tax system, you know, the nine states without income taxes. Some of them have business taxes, though, and only a couple have neither. Uh, the one thing that I would say is it's awfully tough to get there, and that's, you know, where your work's going to be, and as I'm sure it has been over the last few years. And I know many of us will help provide resources to talk about, you know, how the states have gotten it right are benefiting uh, in rich states, poor states, and other publications. But it's been 30 years since the state has eliminated an income tax, and that was Alaska. Uh, they had some help from that black stuff in the ground up there. Uh, you know, and it, it's a tough thing to get to, especially when a state, you know, relies on income taxes for, what, 40% of the uh, state revenue or something like that in Georgia. I don't know what year, what percentage it is. Uh, Louisiana was a little bit easier because it was, what, uh, 15 or 20 percent of uh, state general fund anyways with income taxes, but it's a heavy lift to get there. And I think we have to definitely talk about the success stories of those nine other states that have been there, uh, and, and hopefully that will help uh, you know make the case. But you know, as we saw in North Carolina, as we've seen in Louisiana and Nebraska and other states that have really taken this up seriously, the opponents come out of the woodwork because this is ground zero. This is their funding source for all their you know big government spending ideas. And I think we need to, it's important to note, to move the needle. I think we need to acknowledge that we've got to compromise along the way. Um, it's a lot easier to move somebody slowly towards your position than it is to just cold turkey go try and eliminate an income tax. That's tough to sell. It's very tough to sell, especially in states that rely on it heavily. And um, like, I, I think maybe we might have hope with, with Louisiana next year, and maybe if we can do that there, we can do it elsewhere too. So I'm hoping that we can see some leadership. Well, thank you so much. Like I said, our, uh, I'd like to go a round of applause for all our speakers. Thank you We're going to go right into our energy and environment panel. Um, and then, like I said, after that, we'll probably have a 30-minute break or so before lunch. Um, so thank you again.